that. Um, is there anything else that so we use? I think you missed the biggest point. We developed this whole project in Python, right? <laughs> <laughs> Hello everyone, this is Ishtia Kusen, uh, Alec Goldenberg and David Martinez. We are with the University of Pennsylvania State University, Abington. And this presentation is about the software we developed uh, for our course, software engineering course uh, this fall. Before we start the presentation, let me just give you a brief context uh, or overview what we did and why we did it. So. The course being software engineering course, uh, it's a project based course and we were thinking to develop some app and we wanted to have a real life experience of actually developing a software. And instead of developing a toy project or toy software, we uh, thought it might be helpful to get a real customer uh, for our software. So what I did, I sent out an email to the list uh, among our faculties here and I requested, hey, if you guys have any cool projects, something that you want um, students to help build um, a software for you. I got really good response and uh, one of the responses were from our division head, uh, Professor Zafar Hatayat. He said that he uh, could use a course scheduling algorithm or app that would help him um, schedule all the courses uh, in science and engineering. So we had him as our customer throughout the whole process and then I think we did a good job creating a software for him. So Alec, would you just take it away and, and present the software to everyone? Absolutely, so I'll share my screen here. So here we have our application that we worked on. Uh, you can see the UI here, a user interface made by my friend and colleague, David. Uh, he'll talk about that. He'll talk about that in a little bit, but first I just wanna show you the most basic way you can utilize this program start to finish um, without any of the frills that might come with some of the other tabs. So as Ishtik said, the basic idea of this program is to take a uh, input Excel file of uh, a list of courses and whatnot, which I'll show you, and output uh, a schedule for you and a list of conflicts associated with that schedule. So I'll show you first off here, we have our input Excel file. So in the README, we'll talk a little bit more specifically about the actual formatting of a lot of these things. But I think generally it's important to understand that you're gonna want one tab with the list of professors and courses that they can teach and how many hours that they can teach. One tab being the full list of courses that you're gonna offer in a specific semester. Uh, this has a ton of information on it, which, like I said, we'll, we'll be more specific about in the README, which I'll also show you a little bit of. Uh, one tab for classrooms and their capacities. So here at Penn State Abington, we have uh, a couple different buildings and we have them uh, with their acronyms here and what numbers and what kind of class they are. And then finally, the meeting times. So this is one of the more complicated parts of the formatting. But generally, you just need to understand that a lot of um, campuses, I'll say, will have a class that runs Monday, Wednesday, Friday for a certain amount of hours, certain time. And that's what you want to have here. And you'll have all of those here. And if this is formatted correctly, you will get an output that looks something like this. And I'm showing you the output before the, the class, just because this is a little bit more interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, so this output will show you the full list of courses that you've put in, the staff that's teaching it, where it's being taught at, and the full information about the meeting time, like what day it is, what specific time, and how long it is. So this will show you all the classes that you put in, and you'll notice that some will say staff. We'll get into that later a little bit, but uh, secondary to this, there will also be a conflicts tab with a full list of the conflicts that you'll see in the schedule. Um, I don't know if we want to go into it too much. We can talk about the difference between major and minor. Yeah, like I was wondering why do, would we have some conflicts? Um, can you give an example? Yeah, so uh, this actually comes really down to the input file that we have currently working on. Uh, you'll see a lot of these faculty exceeds contact hours 
a lot of these conflicts are either faculty exceeds contact hours or a faculty has unused contact hours. Mm -hmm. This comes down to the fact that the current uh, input file that we have, there is just no way the, the algorithm could have made a, a conflict list schedule just because there's too many classes that need to be taught by too few professors okay. and there's too few classes for the other professors. Mm -hmm. So this comes down to the faculty preference ultimately because so we want to give the professors the courses that they're able to teach. Nice. And if, if there's a problem here, then you're going to see it in the conflict. Um, but just for understanding sake, there's major and minor conflicts. You only see major ones here, but there will be minor ones at the bottom if there are any. Major conflicts are, as they sound, they are big. They are conflicts that if they have occurred, they, they physically cannot happen. The schedule will not work. So a good example on this list is physics 211 and physics 250 are scheduled on the same room nice. at the same time. Mm -hmm. This can't happen. Mm -hmm. There's no way around this. You can't teach two courses in the same room at the same time. This would have to be altered. Okay. A minor conflict may show up as uh, a professor having a course that is outside their preferred time. Or maybe, if, if I recall right, uh, if if a um, co-current course, two, like, some yes. course, yeah, maybe you can elaborate on that. Uh, yes, so two, here we are, it would be two co -recs, yes. Mm -hmm. So uh, a co-requisite is when a class, for example, uh, Biology, I mean, that's not a great example. Biology 162 is a co-requisite of 161. So your average student should be taking those in the same semester. Mm -hmm. So we want to avoid scheduling them at the same time because we want to give the students as many opportunities to take these classes as they can. But if they are on the same time, the schedule can still work. Yeah, okay. It doesn't, it's not physically impossible to have these classes scheduled at the same time. It would work. Mm -hmm. So that gives you an idea of the minor conflicts and the major conflicts, and you've now seen the input and the output. So I'll just go straight into showing you what this program looks like. So here we have our main tab, the course scheduling tab. This is where you're going to be doing all of your uh, button pressing to get your schedule. Okay. okay. So there's a couple of buttons here you're going to want to worry about. They're, they're going to be the buttons that you're going to be pressing most likely to get the output. You are a division head somewhere, you, or you're a professor somewhere, and you want to help build the schedule. This first uh, button here, this little arrow, is going to bring up your file explorer, wherever your computer is, so that you can find your input Excel file. So you create the input Excel file with all of your classes and everything, and then you give it to the program. So mine is right here. You can double click on this or you can just click it and then click open. And then that will populate that uh, search area with the file basically. Mm -hmm. So now you know that the program successfully has your file. What you're going to want to do after that is then set where you want the scheduling, uh, the actual schedule, the output Excel file that I showed you, where you want to set where you want that to go. Because mm -hmm. if you go, you could just put it in the same folder that you got your input from. You could put it really anywhere. So I'm just going to select that. And now you're ready to start. Uh, and then once you're ready, you just click start. So now what you'll see here is some information that you probably don't care about, but some information that I think you will care about. First things first, it'll show you the generation number. Uh, I may talk about that later if someone else might talk about that, but we're using a genetic algorithm which is generation based. So the program will go over the course of hundreds, if not thousands of generations to find the best schedule. So you'll see that number going up, which you probably aren't that interested in, but you will be interested in is the number right below this, which is the number of major conflicts and the number of minor conflicts. So far, so right? you can see this working in real time and see the number of conflicts going down as the program is running. Um, you can keep an eye on that and see if it gets to a number you're comfortable with, or you can just let the program finish to completion 
and it should uh, have as low conflict number as possible. Yeah, just just to add here, Alec. Uh, so the program can take up to two hours or maybe three hours, depending on the input yeah. file, to, to run and come up with the best uh, schedule. So, but if if someone is in a time crunch and he wants to have a schedule, the best schedule at this point right now that right now its generation has created like 70 um one possible solution uh, i mean generations of uh schedules he, mm -hmm. then the people uh, i mean the user can just click the stop button and it will just generate the latest schedule at that point of time right absolutely yes so if at any point uh programs are running too long you need to stop it um you can just hit the stop button and it'll immediately uh cease the generation of the program and your results will get generated and you'll get a little message here and you can find the schedule.xlsx file in your specified directory here it'll output this uh type of file with the full information um, obviously if you stop it ahead of time it's not going to be uh, as low of a number of conflicts but it'll still mm -hmm. uh maintain whatever progress it had and then when you close this and run it again you will, it'll start from generation zero again. So uh, just quickly go over we have a couple other tabs here. This is more for advanced users, somebody that's familiar with genetic algorithms, but uh, these are some settings related to the genetic algorithm that we allow the user to change because it will affect the speed of the algorithm. Um, it'll affect how it runs basically. So if you think that you have a, a better understanding of what you need or you know you might have a different idea for the settings here you can change them and if you do accidentally mess with them and you don't want to you can always hit reset settings and it'll set them back to what we have them set as yeah and just to clarify one thing for example maximum iteration 600 uh, if i recall it right it means that if a schedule cannot cannot get better uh, and it has tried 600 times from the last created schedule, then it will stop. Like it will say, yes. yeah, I have tried too many times and still I cannot improve the schedule, let's stop it, right? That's the yes. maximum iteration. Yeah, so if you want to give it less leeway and you only want it to go through 50 iterations of non-improvement, mm -hmm. you can set this as 50 and it will, you hit save and then you can run it mm -hmm. and it will run it based on only allowing 50 iterations before it closes if there's no improvement. Correct, very good, yep. Um, and then there's a little link to our README. And then on the final tab, there's some information related to each of the people involved in the project. And of course, special thank you to our division head, Dr. Hadahat, who oversaw a lot of this, allowed us to experiment on his uh, course scheduling algorithm that he wanted to have done. And then before anyone else uh, goes in anything, I'll just show you quickly our README here. It's still, all this stuff is still in progress. We're still working on uh, creating more things for the README and updating the program as well. But uh, this is really good if you want to get an understanding of how the program works. There will be sections, but there currently is a section on just how the program works. There's some more complicated information on the actual input and output formatting. So mm -hmm. you can go here and really get an understanding of what exactly the input file should look like. And it shows you a little bit of what the output will look like. I already showed you that. So it's really just the same. And then we will go into depth here on what the actual config settings can do and what they specifically will achieve in the genetic algorithm. And then at the end, there's basically what I'm doing right now, which is a demo of how to run the program start to finish uh, in the most basic way possible. Yep. But uh, if you go back to the program, I think uh, you it, the, the link to this document is in the help tab, right? Yes. So yeah, if you go to the help tab and you copy this and put it into your browser of choice, this will send you right here to this uh, README file. Very good. Yeah, I see one bug there though. Uh, the indentation is not right. Uh, yes, so unfortunately, the, there's still some, <laughs> there's still some things to iron out. The yeah. indentation is a little off here, yeah. but um, you get get links to all of our LinkedIn's and uh, you get some uh, not citations, but you get some 
information on where this is inspired from and where we kind of learned a lot of this stuff from. Very good, very good. Yeah. So let's let's talk like a couple more minutes about the technical details. And David, do you want to walk us through what we did and uh, what tools, technologies we used? Yeah, yeah. so uh, currently we use uh, Bitbucket to like store our project. Um, when it's finished, it'll be open source for anyone to use and add upon. Um, so the, the GUI we just looked at, the main application, that was we used Tekinter for that. And there was another additional library we used called Pi, Pi Guru, And it allowed us to like, quickly make changes as it was like a, it's like a GUI builder. So you just add the widgets on there. Um, yeah, they had like um, the one widget where you were able to pick the path. That was, that was from the, the GUI builder. So if you guys are ever interested in doing something like that, like I recommend using Pi Guru. And also, the main functionality with um, the reading the Excel file and writing to Excel file, we use Pandas, and that enabled us to do that. Um, is there anything else that so we use? I think you missed the biggest point. We developed this whole project in Python, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. That's, that's important. Okay. And, um, and we used also, I think you guys used regular expressions heavily to... Um, Format the text, read the text, and and um, input formatting was a big issue for us, right? Yeah, it was a big pain. Okay. Yeah, that's a uh, in the input file there. I can actually I can include that in the readme as well. I can give some examples of the the regex because that's how everything is done on the the back end as far as interpreting all those input Excel files. It's all done through regex for the most part. All right. Okay. Great. So, um, yeah. It was a nice demo, and uh, if you guys have any other questions, uh, just comment in the link below, and uh, we will put this up in YouTube, right? So, uh, and um, let us know if you, if how you liked it, and if you have any questions, concerns, give us an email. We'll get back to you, right? Yep. Okay. Thank you. Cool. Thank you, Thank David. You. Thanks, Alec. See you later. Bye.